Beresford. Uh, I was born in Wellington, Shropshire, in England in 1950. And I play the piano, I play free improvised music, and I do other things as well. But I was very interested in music, I think, from the beginning, because both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side, uh, both they both went dancing all the time. And my dad was a big band singer. My mother's father was a violinist. My dad's father played uh, harmonium. So there was a big musical background for me. My first encounter with free improvisation was when I was listening to a program on Sunday nights on uh, BBC Radio and they had UK based mainly jazz musicians but they had other types of players as well and they had I think the, the spontaneous music ensemble or maybe the spontaneous music orchestra I'm not sure but this was an ensemble run by John Stevens and I think they were playing sustain piece because I remember lots of sustains. And that was the first time I heard completely free improvisation. But before that, I'd certainly heard Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, Albert Eiler. I was reading The Melody Maker every week, which was, I think, uh, edited by Richard Williams, or he had a lot to do with it. I went to York University in 1968. Um, at that time, I was playing with a local soul band. We were doing Stax and Motown songs. I was playing the Hammond organ. I really enjoyed that. But I was getting more and more interested also in things like the John Coltrane Quartet, Miles Davis's group with John Coltrane. Um, and that was the music that I was listening to and also trying to find out about free improvisation. Uh, following a short stay in London that didn't work out, I went back to York and started working with musicians in York and formed um, a free improvisation group called Bread and Cheese with two American musicians, Neil Lamb and Dave Hertzfeld. And we got to know the people who were working in London. That means Evan Parker, Derek Bailey, um, Paul Lytton, some people from Europe, Peter Brotsman, Fred Van Hove. And we found some money to bring them to the university and present them playing free improvisation. And that got very exciting. So by the end of three years, it was clear that I, wh where I should be was London. And I moved to London in 74, finally, because I wanted to be around the new budding free improvisation scene, which was getting stronger and stronger at that time. Uh, and I hung out with Derek Bailey, who played guitar, and Evan Parker, who played saxophone. I went to a tiny, tiny club in Soho called the Little Theatre Club, and I met people uh, now called the Second Generation. So they were a little younger than Evan and Derek. Uh, people like Nigel Coombs, John Russell, Dave Solomon, Gary Todd, and also Terry Day, uh, who was a little older than us. And we started playing in all sorts of combinations. One of the characteristics of the London um, improvisation scene is that we tend to all play with each other in trios, quartets, duos. And there aren't any really set groups. Sometimes there are set groups. Um, but quite often they're not set groups. Groups. It's just people working together in different ways. <laughs>
focus has always been on free improvisation. I've also really enjoyed working in other worlds, um, film music, popular music. Uh, David Toop and I published, uh, produced um, a record called We Are Frank Chickens with a Japanese duo. Uh, and that was a long time ago. Of course, it doesn't have a date on the record, but I guess the 80s, at some point in the 80s, which, as you can see, it was quite nicely produced and everything. We were very influenced by early hip-hop, but also by um, Japanese monster movies, um, the um, more amusing aspects of Japanese culture and some of the more traditional ones. I also wrote a bunch of film scores. The first one was uh, set in Albania, so I had to listen to a lot of Albanian music, which I really loved. It's called Avril Brise, Avril Brise, and it was uh, directed by Lyria Begeja, who is an Albanian woman living in France. So I got to do lots of other things as well. David Toop and I, we were in a group called Alterations with Terry Day and Peter Cusack, but we had side projects. One of them was this record uh, by, we had a group called General Strike, and we made a record called Danger in Paradise. And it was a sort of side project to a group called The Flying Lizards, which was run by David Cunningham, who did a cover version of Money, Barrett Strong song from early town and Motown. And that became quite a hit in this country. And people still use it, particularly for adverts for banks and things like that. So I was active in a lot of other fields, but I was always playing free improvisation. Uh, and the world of free improvisation from being about 12 people in London, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we really can't count the number of people playing free improvisation, even just in London. Um, if we go to Tokyo, New York, Berlin, lots of other places, you'll find scenes as well with some fantastic musicians. Obviously, over the years, from 1974 to 2017, that's quite a long time, and the music did change. Free improvisation did change. Um, I think pretty well always for the better, in a way. It went through periods where people were very interested in using lots of silence. And that, of course, in a way was a relief. If you'd heard a lot of rather uh, enthusiastic jam sessions that perhaps involved too many notes. So playing a few lesser notes was a good idea. A few fewer notes was a good idea. Um, it also became more diverse. Lots more women got involved. Um, some of the most important musicians I work with for me are women musicians now, although there are lots of really great men musicians, uh, of course. Um, people started involving new technology, obviously, digital technology came in, people started using electronics in all sorts of ways. Ironically, that technology is still not really fast enough to cope with some of the things that happen in free improvisation when people play drums and saxophones and pianos. Um, but clearly, there's been a development. There have been lots and lots and lots of little record companies. Some of them are still with us. Certainly hasn't had anything much to do with what they call the music industry in terms of large companies, apart from a few tiny moments where, for instance, CBS signed Howard Riley, Tony Oxley, um, and a few other people, and made two or three records with them, which were very good records, um, and then they were dropped. And that's the sort of pattern with any even medium-sized record company. Nearly all the records are put out by groups of musicians or enthusiasts who... Um, do a very good job and there are lots and lots and lots of records as well uh, as of course lots of downloads of all sorts of things if you were to investigate the London scene you'd see an awful lot of different types of players working within the world we call free improvisation <laughs>
there are also lots of venues in London for free improvisation. Um, if you go for a car ride around London with the saxophonist Evan Parker, probably every three minutes he will say, that was a venue, that was a venue, that was a venue. Most of those venues were upstairs rooms in pubs at one point. Of course, they didn't have pianos. So I got interested in using toy pianos initially. They're not so fashionable now, but in sort of Victorian times, I think they were very fashionable. And I bought lots of toy pianos. I bought tiny, tiny amplifiers, battery operated amplifiers with contact microphones and small instruments, sometimes from toy shops um, and built up a very large collection of these things. And I tended to use those. Well, I had to use those if there was no piano. But also um, the piano, especially the grand piano, however ropey the piano is, can be made to do other things. You can, for instance, touch the strings. You can find harmonics, particularly on bass strings. You can sweep your hand across the strings, uh, sort of almost like a harp. If you look at the music of Henry Cowell, an American composer, he was one of the first people to actually notate this stuff. Um, and you can damp strings so you get much uh, shorter notes, all sorts of stuff. And then you can put things in the strings. This is called prepared piano. And this was done particularly by John Cage. He kind of invented it. And it's a way of um, turning the piano into more of a percussion instrument by putting things like India rubbers, screws, or s stuff like that in, into the piano and securing them between the strings and you get a very very different sound from the piano in that way also i'm very influenced by david tudor who was john cage's um long time piano player and Ch tudor did stuff with contact microphones scraping contact microphones on the strings and putting it through amplification contact microphones are, are microphones they don't wor work on the vibrations in the air they work on the vibrations of a solid so you can put a contact microphone on a table um, on all sorts of things anything that vibrates a contact microphone will pick up that sound so they're very useful so uh, when i play the piano sometimes i bring lots of electronics sometimes i bring very few electronics and i tend to work battery operated cheap electronics and the sort of things that i use to uh, produce sound are very very old-fashioned uh, samplers maybe from the 80s mid 80s um, they're not sort of no maybe a little later than that but they're, they're very old um, but I never use a laptop because um, the danger is you'll fire it up and it suddenly won't be working and then you've got nothing to work with if you've got lots and lots of different things they're also likely to go wrong but you can always put one on one side and still use the rest of it. In fact, I've got to the point where I'm so used to my electronics going wrong, I sort of panic if they don't. For me, sometimes the story, the narrative of the performance is as much to do with me struggling with my equipment going wrong as it is with anything else. <laughs>
of the things that crops up uh, for most musicians, but I think particularly for free improvising musicians, is an interest in visual art, in uh, painting, in video, in movies. And uh, the group Alterations had Terry Day in it, and Terry Day, sort of unknown to us at the time, was painting. He's been painting since the early 60s, and painting and drawing. Uh, as well as playing saxophone, drums, uh, making bamboo reed pipes, stuff like that. And I only discovered this after Blanca Regina, who's my partner in the Unpredictable series, and we do lots of things together. Uh, Blanca went round to Terry's house, and he presented uh, masses and masses of artworks. Um, this has become... A book, Terry Day's artwork, it's called A Compilation of the Unseen. These were unseen. Oh, look, this is a particularly good prep page, I think. These are absolutely beautiful. So, um, I've always been excited about particularly painting. I love Kandinsky, for instance. I love Malevich. Um, I'm very interested in Marcel Duchamp, Joseph Cornell, stuff like that. And they connect with music in all sorts of ways. Um, I've worked with... Christian Markley, who's a Swiss-American visual artist and also a sort of avant-garde DJ, uh, a lot. Uh, we've done lots of projects together, uh, usually involving video and music. Um, this is a vinyl record, as you can see, made quite recently, 2015. 2015. Um, it's a screen print designed by Christian Markley. It's an... Um, very limited edition of a recording of some stuff I did at White Cube in Bermondsey. Christian had a fantastic exhibition there and one of the things about the exhibition is that they'd put a whole pressing plant in the actual art gallery together with a screen printing setup and we performed a lot of music and it was all direct cut in the room that it was played in. This was all very exciting. I've worked with Christian Marclay a lot on different projects. He has a thing called Screenplay, for instance, which is uh, a montage of black and white films, but with no soundtrack, and you play the soundtrack live, or at least you play some music of some description with it. Uh, lots and lots of different things I've done with, with Christian. And it just reflects uh, a general interest, I think, in visual art. Um, and this is reflected in things that I do particularly with Blanca like Strange Umbrellas which involves uh, video art uh, it involves film it involves lots of other things as well as free improvisation usually these go together quite well <laughs> not the beginning but uh, quite back in into the mid 70s um, the kind of self organization that free improvising musicians took for granted really because we had to organize everything because nobody else was going to do it for us we'd organize our own gigs we'd organize uh, we'd make our own flyers for instance things like that and we started a magazine this was me and lots of other people, which has been bound into one enormous volume that I can hardly pick up, <clears throat> called Music's a British Magazine of Improvised Music and Art, and it was put out by um, 
Thurston Moore and Eva Prinz's imprint. It's called Ecstatic Peace Library. And the early issues were almost unreadably badly printed, and, um, but it got better towards the end. And what I've realised is that there are huge connections made right through all the editions of Musics, really, with performance art, with painting, with video art, things like that. Um, there's a John Latham cover, which I can't find now, but we did have John Latham do a cover for us. We also had Nigel Coombs, the violinist, do a very amusing cover. We had different artists doing all sorts of things. This is the one Nigel did, which is a concert pianist playing the piano outside somebody's house and they're throwing a bucket of water at the piano player. Very good. Um, so we did these things over and over. So these um, album sleeves are obviously part of art. So Terry Day's artworks here. These are very beautiful. And I think a lot of them have a, a real musicality about them anyway. There's a thing in conventional music education called theory. Um, and it's really weird because it's not really theory at all. It's actually to do with treating the music as though it has laws and then telling people what those laws are. And of course there are, there are harmonic laws, there are laws that, that seem to govern everything in the known world, things like the harmonic series, the, the way things vibrate together, things stuff like that. But the laws that are taught in classical music are about um, cadences, about what notes you can use together, what constitutes a chord, things like this. So that works if you want to write music that sounds like Mozart. It's very handy. And it's handy for other things, but it's not really theory. It's kind of more like pastiche. Now, the struggle to find a theory for free improvised music, I think, will continue. I don't think there are any theories. I think David Toop's book, Into the Milestone, has talked about improvised music very, very well, but it hasn't proposed a massive unifying theory behind it. And that makes it, in a way, more difficult to teach. But you can't teach free improvisation directly, um, partially because free improvisation, really in the, in the spirit of jazz, I suppose, if we think of the sound of Coleman Hawkins' tenor saxophone, that's very different from the sound of John Coltrane's tenor saxophone. The personality of the musician is terribly important in jazz and also in free improvisation. And you can't teach personality. And people have different approaches to the music. Some people come, like um, Dave Tucker, comes from playing in The Fall, this notorious Manchester rock group. Some people, like Phil Vaxman, studied with Nadia Boulanger in Paris and has a, a very strong classical background. They have different backgrounds, but they have their own voice in the music. And that you can't teach. What you can do is to create an environment where those people can develop themselves. They can work with lots of other people. Uh, Paul Litton used to have a slogan, earn, earn, while you're, earn while you learn, it was, earn while you learn. And uh, the idea is that you develop your abilities as an improvising musician while performing, because really performing teaches you something that nothing else can. <laughs> Um, 
um, for many years, pretty well every month, we've been performing with a group called the London Improvisers Orchestra. This grew out of a thing called London Skyscraper, which the late cornetist and conductor uh, Butch Morris, Lawrence Butch Morris from New York, ran. Well, he, he ran it for a couple of weeks when we did a tour of the UK. And uh, he had his own technique of using improvised conducting, which would uh, influence the music that the orchestra was playing. It's a large improvising orchestra. That was called, um, as I said, London Skyscraper. But, but when Butch <clears throat> left and we were left to our own devices, about a year later, after the tour of the UK, we decided we liked working in large groups and we wanted to continue. So ever since then, Huge numbers of people have passed through the LIO and uh, anybody in the orchestra can do a conduction. So we, we switch the conducting roles between people in the orchestra. And also we do completely free improvised pieces with the London Improvised Orchestra. And we um, work with lots of other people who, we like working with people who are just passing through our friends. They might be coming from Berlin or Paris or something. So they can sit in with the orchestra.